Well, last week we kicked off this new series as uh, we look at fault lines. We talked about what fault lines were, and we also talked about what fault lines might be. At the same time, we talked about the reality that God wants us to continue to grow in our lives. He wants, to continue, wants us to continue to step forward. We are growing in some way. That is a reality in all aspects. We are growing. You are growing in some way. God calls us to grow specifically and intentionally in a relationship with His Son, Jesus. And many times as we look at this series and we look at fault lines in general, fault lines become those moments to which we grow as a result of a a time of darkness or a time of brokenness, a time of discouragement, a time of loss, a time that we didn't necessarily plan but somehow came to us or happened to us. And perhaps you look back in life and you think about the things in life that that have been the most difficult and recognize at the same time that those in some cases or many cases, if you allowed God to work in and through them, have become some of the most formative times in your spiritual walk. And if you look back at those moments and they haven't, perhaps it's time to revisit those times and allow God to teach you maybe something that He wanted to in those moments when you walked through them. Today we're going to look at one of Jesus' fish stories. It's interesting how biblical and spiritual fishing is, and I can say that as a fisherman, because Jesus talked about fishermen, He talked with fishermen, He engaged with fishermen. About 20 years ago, my my sister and brother-in-law, they received a call, accepted a call to serve at a church in northern Michigan. And a couple of years after they uh, got there, they recognized the amount of tourism uh, that took place in their community and the surrounding communities. And specifically, one of the things that that was really big was the running of the salmon in uh, a couple of the rivers that were near their house. And so something that that really kind of happened by accident was that my, uh, my, my family began to visit on an annual basis in October to go up for an annual fishing trip, a salmon fishing trip, uh, where we would stay at her home and in a, in a couple different places there as, as the trip got larger, and we would fish for salmon. It was a fun visit. It was a fun engagement. And let me just tell you, as it started, it started small and then got larger and larger and larger. As it started, it started as something where a bunch of guys, mostly well, guys and ladies from Ohio, would go up there that had really no idea how to uh, salmon fish. And let me just say right now, I don't want to update my Adobe Illustrator. Okay, crisis averted. In any event, as um, as we began to to do this trip, the the first couple of years I was unable to go, and so I was on the third year I went. I was a little bit behind the eight ball. I didn't know much about it. Everybody else had a couple of years under their belt. I, I knew the equipment I needed. I had my waders. I had a pole. I had, you know, the, 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 the layers that were needed to stay warm. I had some gloves. I had, um, you know, the, the right tackle. And I remember specifically that first time walking down to the river and everybody else kind of that had been there before just kind of walked into their places, got into places that they'd been previous years. And I just kind of stood there thinking, I don't really know what to do. And so I asked my dad, and he said, well, just kind of find a spot and just ease into it. And if you wear the right glasses, which I had because I, I was told to, to, to get a polarized sunglasses, if you wear the right glasses, you can literally see the fish in the water. And he just kind of cast at them. And I thought, oh, okay, that, that seems easy enough. And so I found a spot where I could maybe see some fish, and it turns out they were fish. Sometimes you cast at rocks, which there's probably another illustration there. But you could see the fish, and I, and I began to walk towards uh, the fish into the water. And I had waders on, and so I was safe, right? I was, I was not going to get wet, and the, the river was flowing, and it was not necessarily extremely uh, you know, violent where I was, so I felt fairly comfortable where I was, and I got in about to my knees, And I recognized the difficulty of casting the line where the fish were because the river would take my line every single time I lure away. And I I thought, okay, I'll just get a little bit closer. And I'll get a a little bit closer. And, And eventually I found myself almost right on top of the fish. But at the same time, I was having more difficulty now casting at the fish because the water that was coming at me was so violent and it was so difficult to even keep my footing. 
And as it was about this high on me, just a, a few inches below the top of my waders, I was getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And I found myself kind of sidestepping down the river, trying to still cast and move. And eventually, as I looked around, I recognized everybody else was kind of back, right? If I wanted to see anybody else that I was fishing with, I would have had to turn my head almost like this, either upriver or downriver, to see them in the water. You might recognize, Steve, you're out too far. Well, I didn't know that at the time. I had my eyes on the fish. I had my eyes on the thing that I desired to do, the thing that I desired most. And eventually, a guy that was one of the, I would call him one of the, the, um, the guides that we had. There was two or three local guys that would come out, especially as we started out, to help us out. He was a big guy. Matter of fact, he was kind of like... Uh, a grizzly bear in a lot of ways. He was just a, a, a big, strong guy. And I, was, I remember I was out there and I kind of started walking and I heard him say, Steve, you're out too far, right? I heard it clearly and I thought, yeah, I know, but I want to try to catch these fish. And if I, if I lock into one, I'll be able to kind of get balance and he'll calibrate me like the fish will. I don't know what I was thinking. And so I, I was, I was kind of moving forward and, I, and eventually I recognized too that Typically in the river, you can see the bottom, but where I was, it was getting dark, and I couldn't really see the bottom or anything that was in front of me. And so I took another step, and as I did, I began to slip, and just then I felt this paw grab the back of my waders and pull me back two or three steps. And it was that guide that I called the grizzly bear, which I'm so thankful today that he was willing enough to not just tell me what to do, but to come over and help me a little bit. I will tell you now, afterwards, when I took that, that second to last step, right before I got in almost too far, I was very, very fearful. In fact, if somebody took a picture of me, I'm sure my eyes were huge because I recognized that I was in a place where I could not control anything anymore. In fact, without the intervention of a friend, I probably would have gone underwater and been tumbled down the river, and, and who knows what would happen. In fact, it's very dangerous because when water fills up your waders, you can't control your body anymore. And so at that point, when he pulled me back, I recognized the fact that I was in a very dangerous place. I was in a place where I could not control, and in the, the, the midst of that call and that urging and that help, I received something new. In fact, at that point, as I recognized where the fish were, the, the person, the guide that was with me said, there's a channel that runs down this river. And from the safety of shore, he was able to point out where the channel went. He said, that channel is 25 foot deep in some places. And so while you were, you know, just three to four foot deep and it seemed really intense, if you would have taken another step or two forward, you would have slipped into that channel and probably been lost. And so at that point, as he gave this call, he said, look, here's what we're going to do. There's what we call a shelf down or upstream over here where it gets a little bit shallow. You can kind of walk across. If you do so, you will be up to your ankles in water and be right on top of those fish. And so what he did, he served to give me a call, a new call, even in the midst of the danger to which I was in, to help me recognize there is a different way, there is a new way, there is something else that you can't even imagine that exists to help you to understand, to know that this is not the right way, this is not the next step, this is not what you should be doing, instead, I have something else for you. Now, spiritually speaking, let me say, today's passage, as we look at Jesus' calling of some of his disciples in Luke's gospel, there were men that were fishermen. That was their thing. That's what they did. They understood. That was their, the family business. That was what they were all about. And Jesus comes along and he says, okay, I have a new way. You just, you are distraught. You are discouraged because business wasn't good specifically at this point. And I have a new way for you, a new call for you. I love today's passage. I love what we're going to be walking through today for many reasons. One of them is because it is a, a, a fish story, and I love that, that Jesus kind of flexes his muscles and said, look, if you want to learn how to fish, let me show you how to do this. But I also love it because he records him calling the disciples out to a new day. You know, when a company launches a hiring program, typically they look for the most experienced, the most successful candidates, those that have proven themselves, those that know what they're doing. God doesn't do that. 
In fact, when Jesus calls the disciples, he doesn't go to the temple and say, okay, I want the, the brightest and the best, the top of the class with the highest GPA that, that has the most influence. Instead, he goes to the ones with character, the ones that, that the fishermen, the ones that are open, that will listen, that follow the call. In fact, we look at his call throughout the scripture and, and we see that God calls uh, Moses a man who really uh, had, had nowhere to go, if, if you think about this for a moment. He was called out of a comfortable place in Egypt where he knew everybody and, and was told, hey, because of your heritage, I want you to take my people, a group that you really aren't acquainted with, and I want you to take them into an unknown place that I have promised for them. I want you to lead them in a way that, that, a, a way that you have never done before. He takes him from a place of, of really insecurity and, and, and really a, a place of, of challenge because of what Moses had just done as he'd committed these crimes. And he says, here is a new day. Jesus, or God took a, a young shepherd boy, a young shepherd boy who, if you were to line him up with all of his brothers, would be the last one you would choose to be the leader. And he said, look, I want this one right here, this one right here to, to slay the giant, to become Judah's king to lead in battle. And then Jesus comes along and he says, okay, where are those? Okay, right, four fishermen. Yeah, that's, those are the ones I want. And those four fishermen right there, those are the ones that I'm going to choose to be my disciples, my apostles, the ones that I'm going to build my church on. And they're the ones that are going to carry on once I die and resurrected and ascend into heaven. Those are the ones I'm going to invest in for the next several years. The first fault line we're going to look at specifically after we talked about this growth process last week is this fault line of calling. A fault line of calling, a season in life that we didn't expect or didn't see coming, a calling that God gives or God grants that we really weren't anticipating. Some of you might recognize a calling in your life as a fault line, maybe when you switched jobs at one point, or maybe when God called you to move somewhere else, or maybe when he said, hey, you know what, I want you to pack up, and, or I want you to sell everything, and I want you to be a missionary overseas somewhere. Maybe that's happened to you, I don't know, but in some instance in your life, God called you to something else. And the tendency is, in most cases, that calling comes as a response to an eye-opening dark time in your life. A time where something might have gone wrong, things aren't really working out, and all of a sudden God says, hey, look, this was the light bulb turning on because I have something new for you today. So as we look at, uh, at Luke's gospel, let me just, uh, just preface this briefly. If you don't know much about Scripture or if you don't know much about the Bible, there's the Old Testament and there's the New Testament. And within the New Testament, there are four specific gospels, which are a recordance of Jesus' life, His teaching, His death, His resurrection. And Luke is one who records the gospel in a way for, for an understanding for, for those both that would read it in the original text and also for us today, to know and understand what Jesus did, why he did it, and for us to be able to apply and to recognize how to apply his teaching. We're going to read from chapter 5 today. I'm going to read it in its entirety, and then we're going to walk back through again. Jesus calls his disciples. Here's how it goes. In verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1, says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will put down the nets. Verse 6 starts, when they, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Paul saw this, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. 
For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that, that, had take, that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, for now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, this is not a light call. This is not a temporal call. This is not a half-in, half-out call. Instead, and the way that the, the, the sermon notes are going to be structured today is simply like last week. We'll have three main points and then two sub-points underneath each one. The first main point is this. The Lord may call us to do what seems impossible. In fact, looking back at verse 4, it says this. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, Jesus was not a fisherman. In fact, I would imagine that in Jesus' his, his experience and uh, uh, his profession, the things he had done, that as he kind of went to this place, he recognized, hey, look, while you guys didn't have a lot of, 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 of success today, while you didn't have a, a lot of, uh, of, of uh, you didn't make a lot of money today, this might be, seem impossible or even unreasonable, but I would like you to try one more time. I know he wasn't a fisherman, but I can imagine that he at least knew people, right? And he at least knew that as he asked this, that the response that he was going to get from them was not necessarily typically going to be one where they would say, oh yeah, sure, you're a master fisherman. We'll follow your lead. We'll do what you say. As we read, we do recognize they do follow, but I would imagine there was a little bit of hesitancy. And the, and the first sub point under that is the Lord commanded a strange but simple task. A strange but simple task. He commanded Simon to, to enter deep water and drop nets down for a catch of fish. I mean, it, it seems simple, but, but man, what a strange thing to ask. What a strange thing for him to ask to do, especially because he wasn't necessarily a, an expert in the area. You might recognize I am overdue for a haircut right now. And um, I will tell you right now that uh, getting a haircut is not necessarily something that's always on my agenda. It's something that's n normally an afterthought. Hey, I'm going to run out to the store. I'll stop by and get a haircut real quick wherever they can get me in right away. And one thing that I do almost every single time that I go to get my haircut is, and I, I need to find a way to make it like my favorite picture, is I will pull up my phone and I will scroll to the picture and I will show it to the, to the person that's going to cut my hair and I'll say, make me look like this again. And I usually give the, hey, I'm really sorry. It's been a while. I always give all of that because normally my hair looks like this and I normally get a lot, uh, a lot of hair cut off, right? And so I always say, you know, make my hair look like this again. And then I kind of just sit there and I, I'll chit chat with the, the person cutting my hair. We'll talk a little bit or if they're not talkative, I'll just kind of sit there and, and, and kind of zone out or whatever it might be. But one time about maybe three haircuts ago, I, I was sitting in the chair and there was a person next to me getting their haircut. And, I, and my, my eyes were open to a different way to which some people get their haircut. Right? This person was sitting there and as she was getting her haircut, she was telling the person cutting their, her hair everything she wanted her to do. It's like, do this, do this, cut it like this, do it like that. Here's how I like it. Here's the one. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of detail. Normally, I just say, make me look like this. And I let them kind of do their thing, right? And usually, they do a good job. This other person coming in, sitting down, sharing, here's all the stuff I want to do. And let me just tell you, I'm not one that even knows any of the terms. I'm not one that knows any of the styles or any of the technique or any of that stuff. But as I sat there, I couldn't help but think, wow, I hope that person knows what they're talking about to be able to tell the, the expert, the one that they're paying to cut their hair, what to do. And I did find out later that person actually works there. They were in for a haircut. They were getting a haircut too. And so it made me feel a little bit better. But in application with this specific point, Jesus, I'm sure, coming in and sharing this, I'm sure the disciples sat there kind of like me thinking, you know what, we got this. Like we just had a terrible evening or terrible day of fishing, and now you're going to tell us what to do? You just stick to the preaching and the healing, and we'll do the fishing. And when we catch some fish, maybe we'll throw a couple your way. You know, the four fishermen, they you know, might have considered this even a waste of time. 
okay, Jesus told us to do something. We, we kind of, I mean, we, we get it. We understand what he's saying as far as his, his messages, but now he's kind of meddling, like trying to get us to do something. But they, even though they thought it was a waste of time, they, they were stepping forward. They were, they were willing to do what he asked, even though Jesus wasn't a fisherman. And the interesting thing is often when we are at the end of ourselves, we're at the beginning of a new opportunity to experience the Lord's power. Because think about this for a minute. They had some very, very, you know, they're, they're washing their nets. They had some very tough times because they basically made their money off of what they were doing. But in this case, just like any other, his adequacy, God's adequacy, can fill the void caused by our inadequacy. Let me say that again, because if you're like me, you feel inadequate sometimes. God's adequacy can fill the void of yours, of my inadequacy. If I were going to amen, that's where I would have done it. I'm just telling you. So get this, he delights to grant success when we have experienced failures. And verse 5 says this, Simon answered, Master, we've, ha- we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And I don't know what the tone is right here, but I'm going to read it in the tone to which I would assume, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Maybe you've been there before. I know I've been there before. Okay, God, I don't know why you want to do this, but because you say so, I'll do X, Y, or Z. Because you've asked me to do so, because you've said, Steve, do this, Steve, step out, Steve, say that, I will do it. And the second sub point under that first main one is this. The fishermen responded with obedience. The fishermen responded with obedience. They did what God called them to do. They did what the Lord told them to do, perhaps reluctantly or without expecting results. Maybe they they thought, okay, God, we'll do this, and then we'll kind of stick it in your face. Like, look, we're the fishermen. See? Look, we didn't catch anything, so next time just kind of leave that to us. But regardless, they obeyed. Perhaps you've heard the story before when several unbelievers were mocking a Christian because of his lifestyle, showing that he obeyed God no matter what God called him to do. They said, if the Lord uh, were asked you or told you to jump through that brick wall over there, what would you do? And the, the Christian replied, it would be my job to jump through the wall. It would be God's job to get me through it. And often that's the case. Right? Perhaps there's a brick wall before you, figuratively or maybe literally, but there's a brick wall before you, and God's calling you to do something. Let me just say, all He's calling you to do is obey by jumping. He will get you through it. He will sustain you. He will fill the void of inadequacy. Our obedience is a crucial to the call, uh, to the factor, uh, our obedience is a crucial factor to the call that God puts on each one of our lives. In fact, I'm going to make this practical right now. So maybe you don't recognize this or not, but, but um, I, I am one person and I, I have uh, a staff of, of about a, a dozen people uh, with custodians all the way up to other pastors that I'm, I'm um, blessed to serve alongside. And then we also have some elected uh, local board of administration and trustees here at the church. But let me just tell you, within that context, within the volunteers and those that, that serve here uh, full-time or part-time vocationally, There is still a lot of work. There are still a lot of things uh, to do uh, for the kingdom, whether it be with this building or outside of this building or whether it be different ministries or whatever that might be. And so let me just say this. There's always opportunity for you to get involved. And the church operates at its fullest when all people, all members of the body are engaged with their gifts And sometimes, let me just say this, sometimes the gifts that you might have, they might not be, you might not be able to use those specifically first because God's trying to do something with you in your, in your character area first. So maybe your gift is, hey, I'd love to do this way up here. And God's first saying, okay, but first I want you to, to, to clean the toilets or to stack the chairs, right? But let me just say, God has something for every person and and either in the the ministry of this church or beyond. And I'm not just saying, I'm not just going to minimize it here, but what I will say is this. It has been somewhat of a difficult season, and some of you have sensed this, you know this because you're involved in some of the ministries here, or you recognize too that that there is a void because you have some involvement like with children's ministry because you have kids, and so you recognize that there's a void there sometimes. Let me just say, we have specific availability 
for you to be able to experience an opportunity to serve God right now in this church, in this local church. And you might be saying, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, let me just say, one of the things that as I was preparing for this sermon this past week, as I went to all of our ministry heads, all the ministry heads that are, of the ministries that are taking place right now, and I said, what needs do you have right now? What, what volunteer needs do you have? And right, right from that, many of them just started writing down, here are the things that, that I need. At the same time, I said, what wish list do you have? What, what would you love to start? What would you love to do to go beyond what you have now? And many of them were writing down, oh, here's some things I'd love to start and love to do, but we just need more people to step in. Let me just say, before you leave today, you have the opportunity to be able to engage in these ministries. If you would like to volunteer or know more about places you could volunteer with kids or with youth or with the tech team or with, or with uh, the, the worship team, anything that takes place, ushers and greeters and anything that takes place here, we would love to have you be involved. At the same time, things outside the building with our mission teams and with, with, our, with our local global impact, we would love to have more involvement. Not just because we recognize that there are places that we need a slot filled, but also because we recognize or ultimately because we recognize that, that life change happens, that, service, or that, that life change ha- happens through the service, through the using and the expressing of our gifts. God doesn't want you to sit by and be a consumer of anything. He wants you to be a contributor. And so we're giving you that option so, or that opportunity. So before you leave today, stop by the table, by the info center. And you can see some of the, the things that are available now that you can jump in this week, this, this, this month and say, hey, I'd love to serve. I'd love to be part of this. I know we've got more ministries that are coming up with Upward Sports and, and, and with some other children's activities that we'd like to do coming up. At the same time, uh, we, we have a, a senior adult ministry that we've been launching and a, and a young adult ministry we've been launching over the course of the last months. We would love to have you involved. Okay, enough with the commercial, but I will say this. I will say this. God wants to use you. He doesn't need to use you because God is God and He could do it without us, but He chooses to use you because He wants you to share in the blessing of building His kingdom. If He's calling you right now, will you say yes? Will you say, because you said so, and at least in obedience, step forward? Because maybe that decision will open the door, not necessarily to say, okay, this is the place I'm going to serve forever, but maybe it opens the door for you to say, okay, this is a place I, I, I don't feel led to serve I'll find another. Or maybe it opens the door for you to, 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 to jump into a new place in the same type of ministry. I, I don't know what it is, but I do know that when God calls us to be obedient, that nothing, nothing has ever happened, nothing bad has ever happened from stepping forward and saying yes to God. The second big point is this. The, Lord, the Lord's call is His enabling. Verse 6 reads once again, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. The fishermen had caught nothing all night. They'd had no luck. They'd done nothing to that point. And their, their prior experience and expertise had failed them. The Lord, however, turned failure into success. He grants success. Get this, God grants success. Sometimes we feel inadequate, but God grants success. Sometimes we feel like we're in a place where we're, we're at the lowest of the lows, but God grants success. Often a hesitancy can come because of, of timing or maybe a lack of confidence in one ability or maybe a doubt in the power of the one who's making the call. Maybe there's a little bit of a doubt, God, maybe you got the wrong person. I'm sure that Moses felt that way. I'm sure that David felt that way. Maybe even these disciples felt that way. I think you got the wrong person. You're looking for my brother. You're looking for so-and-so, but not me. I don't think that I can do this. Maybe you doubt the, the power of the one who's making the call. Like, hey, I'm not prepared. I don't have the ability. I don't have the talent. I don't have the background that somebody else has. Maybe you should call someone else. I'm told that a, 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 a nanny goat, which is a mother goat, can recognize the, the voice of any of her babies. No matter how many kids she ever has, she can recognize the voice of, their, of her babies for her whole life. So whether they are separated and taken somewhere else, she can recognize them forever. And I, I've done some research on this, and I, I, I've, I've found that uh, through confirmation of Wikipedia that this is true, right? Because everything on the internet is true. 
But in any event, I have found it to be somewhat true in, in, my, own, uh, in my own hobby. I, I do have uh, some goats, and, and I, I do enjoy uh, kind of watching them interact. They are a pack animal, and so they stay together. And, and it's interesting when one kind of loses sight of the others, how they'll call out. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to let them out. So I have a, a big pendant area, but I also let them out and just kind of free range in the backyard a little bit. And it's, it's kind of free mowing, so it's really nice. But they'll get out, and they'll kind of run around. And from time to time, I have to put them back in because they won't go in on their own. And so I'll get some treats, and it's amazing what they'll do for just a small Cool Whip container full of corn. But I'll get some treats, and I'll I'll put them together. I'll put some pellets in there, and I'll go in, and I'll shake it. And I'll say, okay, come on, come on, goats, come on in. And and, and they'll begin to come sometimes, but sometimes they just kind of stand there like, no, we're not coming. We know what you're going to do. There's perfectly good flowers that your wife planted over here that we want to eat before we come in. We're not coming in, right? And so I'll be shaking it and shaking it. And finally, I'll take it out to one of the, 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 the trendsetters of the groups, one of the nannies, and I'll let them eat a little bit. And eventually, like, they'll perk up and they're excited and I'll start to walk back towards the pen and they'll just kind of follow right along. And they're following and they're following. The other ones are perking up, like, what's going on there? And as soon as that one calls out, kind of like, hey, yeah, it's safe, let's go, Right? all the rest of them will tear off and follow. All the rest of them will follow and be on their way. And it's almost like the, 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 the confidence factor has gone through the roof because, okay, one that we respect, one that, that we recognize, one that, that we uh, give all of our, of our attention to has said, this is okay, now we can go, now we can follow. All right, we get you, guy with the corn. We understand you, you feed us and you take care of us, but, but, but we're kind of our own deal over here. And so we want to make sure that this is, this is legit before we're going to follow. Let me just tell you, God, first of all, God in some ways, I think, has created the the nanny goat like himself. He never forgets the voice of his children. And at the same time, that call that he has, the way that he, he engages, the way that he, the way that he, he engages with, with any one of us, with any person, there's credibility there because he's the ultimate authority, not just because of he's all powerful, but because he is the source of love. He cares for us. He grants joy for us. He grants peace for us. He's not in it for himself in any way, but instead, because of his love, he works all things out for his glory and for our good. And jumping into the next verse, it's, it's so amazing to see what happens here because he doesn't stop there. It generates this, this process of making disciples who make disciples, right? I love this so much, especially as it pertains to kind of our vision statement of, making, of creating a, a culture of making disciples who make disciples. Because right here we see these disciples were impacted by Jesus' work. They listened, they obeyed. And then the next thing that happens in verse 7 is, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. God did a great work. He brought forth a great bounty, great fruit in their lives, and the result was they held it in and they kept it to themselves, right? No! They told those that were around them, look what's happened here. Look what God's doing. We want you to be part of this. And disciples then continued to make disciples. The movement continued and more were brought into the fold. And the point is this, a, 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 he grants abundant success. It's beyond just the temporal, just the things that we see now, but it's abundant. It's beyond that. And let me just say, you know, not, not only did the, did the nets become, did they start to break, but the fishermen's boats, they were loaded so full that they began to sink. Think about that for just a moment. If we respond in obedience to what the Lord calls us to do, we will be successful. But don't take this the wrong way. This isn't a, okay, when when you come to God, you get all the things you want. Instead, success may not conform to the world's uh, definition of what success is. But it will conform to what God considers success to be. And it will be eternal. Because success in this life that we recognize from the world's perspective is not eternal. It's temporal. It's temporary. But what God grants is success is, is, is eternal. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 24 and 25 says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. 
In fact, 1 John 2, 17 reads, the world, and, the world and it despises pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Rounding this out as we go to the third big point is this, the Lord's call magnifies his grace. The Lord's call magnifies his grace. Verse 8 and 9 reads, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. The call of God sheds light on darkness and provides transformation. Get this. It call, the call of God sheds light on the darkness. So in God's call, there was a, there was a light shining, a light that was shed on the darkness in the life uh, of, of Peter. And so there, there was this recognition that transformation had to happen. There had to be a change in his life. He had to be made new and different because he was in the presence of a holy God. Here we see that it moves into something more spiritual. It's not just about catching fish anymore or following God's rule or his law, but it's also about the formation that he wants to do in and through us through service. The superabundant catch of fish showed Peter and the other men that Jesus was far more than just a man. The event also showed how far below Jesus' perfection that they had fallen. And so therefore, Peter, he, he confesses his sinfulness and urges God for the Father through Jesus to, to depart from him. There's this contrast that we see between sin and between holiness, this past summer, we were able to, to go on a vacation, and, and while we were there, we, were, we would walk on the beach, and I was walking with one of my sons, and, and as we walked, he, he talked about how beautiful things were. And I thought at a young age, well, that's neat that he, he's recognizing the, 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 the sky and the, and the ocean and the sand. And I, and I watched him, especially the, the, the last time we went on a, on, a, on a walk down the beach, I watched him as he uh, brought a Walmart bag or a grocery bag with him, a plastic bag with him and collected the trash along the beach as we walked. And I, I'm, I'm going to brag on him a little bit because I'm, I'm proud of him for doing this. And, and, I, and I recognize, you know, as he walked down there, he wanted to, he wanted to, to, to bring forth an opportunity to, uh, to keep the beauty where it was and to get, you know, pick up litter and get rid of it. But it also illustrates something so much greater in the context of this passage. It's a recognition of the fact, this contrast between the beauty that God created and, and, and the dirtiness, the, 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 uh, the, the, the destruction, the shortcoming of man, of humankind. This contrast brought forth an opportunity not just for them to, to receive, to gain something physical, something tangible in the moment, but also to bring forth the holiness, the understanding that God provides more. He wants more for us and for each one of us and for the people that we serve in a spiritual sense. Verses 10, picking back up, verses 10 and 11 read, And so were James and, and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners, as they were astonished as well. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And that third or that second point under that third big point is this, the Lord uses our shortcomings as a means to commission us for his good works. The Lord uses the fault line moments in our lives, whether they're self-inflicted or whether they just happen to us because of the sinful world that we live in. God uses those things as a means to commission us for his good works. And sometimes it's going to be specific and it's going to be easy and it's going to be clear. This is what I'm calling you to. And sometimes it's going to be something where it's just an eye opener. He says, look, I recognize you've kind of drifted. There's mission drift going on in your life. I have a mission for you. Don't lose sight of what's most important. Yes, continue to work. Continue to do the thing that you do with your hands like, like Paul did. But at the same time, recognize that it's much larger than just going to work every day or going to school every day. There's something greater that I want to accomplish in and through you during this time. The Lord uses our shortcomings as a means to commission us for his good works, for his good. Jesus commands the four fishermen to follow him, and he promised that they would become fishers of men. 
The Lord calls the imperfect to know him and to serve him. The, uh, the, the called and the commissioned uh, fishermen left the greatest business opportunity of their careers to follow Jesus. Get that. It was what they knew. It was their family heritage. It was what they understood. And because of this downtime, God was able to come in through the person of Jesus and say, look, here's what I have for you. See, the Lord's call is more valuable than all the wealth, all the fame, anything that we can, we can, we can gain here on earth. Perhaps the greatest sacrifice, the greatest following of a call can be illustrated through the greatest person who ever lived. Think about this, this, this context for just a moment. God the Son, Jesus is in heaven. He's in a place of holiness. He's in a place where no pain and no anguish with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. And at a certain point, God the Father sends Jesus in, 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 in a humble beginning to earth. He was born as a baby. He grows up in a broken world. He lives a life honoring to God. He lives a life where he, he's, he's completely on board with, with what God the Father has for him and eventually gets to a point in these last days before his death and he recognizes the burden into which he is carrying in his darkest place. Now where he is, what he's walked through, there's things that, 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 that came at him that he did not deserve, that he did not do, that he did not bring on himself. We know that about a holy God, but he's in this place. And at a certain point, God the Father says, okay, now it is time. And timing is everything when it comes to God. Now it is time. And Jesus' response is, you know what? This is not necessarily what I want to do. This is not necessarily what I, I really want to jump into. Not my will, but yours be done. And God the Father's call on his life is to step forward and to fulfill the gospel, the prophecy, the will of the Father. And so Jesus doesn't just kind of share this and say, you know, you should call people, you should tell, I'm going to call people and tell them what to do, and, and we should respond to that. No, he also lived it by coming to this place, which I'm sure is, is the ultimate fault line, coming to a place of brokenness, and then living a, in a place, especially in those last days where I'm sure it would have been easier to just say no and walk away. I'm sure he felt inadequate. I'm sure he felt like he was all alone. And at a certain point, he was all alone. But he said yes. So I want to leave you with this parting question today before we close in prayer. And it, it, it's basically looking at this, the concept of where we are. What, what started as a desperate situation for these fishermen partners became an opportunity to exercise the Lord's call. And here, here's the question. When we are at our lowest point and we find the Lord's beckoning us to a higher call, how will we respond? How will you respond? And I'll even make this more present. Perhaps today you are experiencing it through the, the, the result of this pandemic or through a loss of a loved one or through the loss of a job or, or whatever it might be, a broken relationship. Let me just ask this. How are you? How will you respond to God's call? And I'll even take it a step further. Perhaps... Perhaps here today, you're saying, you know what, I am in a broken place, I'm in a, a, a difficult place, but I haven't heard God call. Maybe the response there is to open yourself up and to see what God wants to say to you at this point. It doesn't say the disciples ran away, it says the disciples were there, they were listening, they were, they were, they were listening to, the, to Jesus talk as they washed their nets, they were, they were in that place, they were in proximity with Jesus. And so maybe backing up, part of it might be, what's God saying to you? And the second thing is, if He's calling you, will you respond?